going to start a little differently this morning. I'm going to make it. I'm going to make it seem like I'm at another at another church because I feel like sometimes, even though the sermon is written on paper, it helps when people it, people actually say it and internalize it themselves. So, in true Otis Moss the third fashion, why don't you turn to your neighbor and say, "Neighbor, neighbor. oh neighbor, oh, neighbor. Put, that put that down." This particular text has caused me to look at myself more as a child of God who is continually improving to be a better version of himself. This text is usually used to point out how Jesus looks at a woman who has been publicly embarrassed and then charges her privately to disengage from the sinful actions she was taking part in. However, most preachers overlook the real issue in the text. The true issue in the text is not that she was to be stoned. Mosaic law had already covered that. The issue wasn't even that she was sneaking around with someone else's significant other, husband, boyfriend, whatever you want to call it, or perhaps maybe that he was dealing, with, dealing in fornication with other women besides the one to which God gave him. The real issue is that the Pharisees were more concerned about being seen than manifesting the power of God and using that space in the temple to heal people of their hurt and loosing people who had been bound. And, not, and I don't just mean bound by sin. I mean bound by systems, bound by structures, bound by addictions, things that they couldn't kick. Come to this point in the text where Jesus is in the holy city. He has already made his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. He has already turned over the tables in the temple and made the Pharisees start looking at him. He is teaching in the temple on one of his, what I like to call, one of his adjunct professor days. He, he of course, has no office hours at this time because he has other duties besides teaching. After all, he is as much a prophet as he is the divine. And those who know the story of Jeremiah know the basic job description of a prophet. Tear down, uproot. Dismantle, and then when you get done with all of that, build and plant. So we see that the Pharisees are not in attendance during this teaching. They miss the lecture series. What are they doing, you may ask? They're snooping around and peeking in bedrooms. So here's what they do. Here's what they do. Here's what they do. They snatch this woman out of bed with this man. Mind you, they're both naked. I might as well go ahead and give you the gory details now. Neither of these people have clothes on. They are literally, as the text suggests, in the very act of adultery. Snatch this woman out of bed, drag her to the temple, and lay him at Jesus' feet. And here's what they say. Jesus, this woman, has been caught in the very act of adultery. Mosaic law states that such a woman should be stoned. What do you say? The object of this was not to follow the Mosaic law. If you notice, they never even bothered her before now. They weren't concerned with what she was doing with Henry in the bed while he was supposed to be married to Susan. They weren't worried about that. They only bothered her when she served a specific purpose they needed fulfilled. Sounds a lot like our government. I won't call any names, but sounds like our government. And in the text, Jesus bends over and writes in the ground. Now, my imagination is that Jesus ignores their foolishness Number one, because he realizes that she's got some sin that she's got to deal with. But number two, he realized that her sin ain't the only one that just walked in the room. (laughs) 
In a sense, he said, you're placing her on blast for something she did, and you forget that you can fit committed numerous sins that if the punishment were tallied up according to the Mosaic law and the measure of your sins, you yourself would be on the list of persons who needed to be either stoned or permitted some other kind of punishment. You use the Mosaic law you so strictly follow to suit your own fancy. The same law you're using to sentence this woman to death is the same law that would condemn you to death. So, to quell this issue, he said, if there are any among you who feel as though you are so perfect that you have never sinned, you have never committed any kind of wrongdoing, you have never fallen short, you have my explicit permission to throw a stone at her. And after a while, you hear stones dropping all over the place. Because when the truth comes out, my mama used to say that her, her uh, I think it was her great-grandma great who always said, if it doesn't come out in the wash, it'll come out in the rinse. <laughs> it hurts when the ugly truth is thrown in your face and the, and the dirty laundry that you thought was shoved in the closet gets lit out for everyone to see just how imperfect you are. But this is what happens to those Pharisees and everybody else in that crowd. Because you see, it wasn't just the Pharisees. A crowd had, growled, had, had gathered around them and they, were all, they all had sticks and stones and other items with which to cast at her. So that's the story, but let's rewind the tape. We as a people have developed this complex and we've kept it going from the beginning of time that says we can deal with airing other people's sins as long as we have convenient amnesia about our own sins. What this text tells us is that every time you want to look at someone else and judge them for what you see on the outside, you need to look at yourself. Consider what it is you're holding on the inside that people can't see. Drag her to a temp they drag her to the temple, and I imagine, you know, they're not quiet about this. They're hurling insults at her. They're, they're making this a public spectacle. I imagine some people might have called her a harlot. Some people might have even called her a homewrecker. And in true 21st century fashion, they probably called her some other words that aren't really suitable for the pulpit or the sanctuary. Jesus basically says, that word that you're about to call her, put it down. That name you're about to label her with, put it down. That judgment you're about to pass on her, put it down. That biblical concept you're going to use to beat up on someone because of their choice to have a same-sex relationship, mind you, whether the Bible says it's right or not, put it down. That torch you're about to use to illuminate their shortcomings, put it down. We have too much to do in the body of Christ to be peeking in bedrooms. So what does this mean? That meant that they were actively looking for stuff. Like they were, they were invading people's personal space, trying to find something to pin Jesus with. They were looking for the juicy news. Problem is, hell is too hot to be peeking in bedrooms. Crooked politicians are still being crooked, and too many people are suffering from it for us to be peeking in bedrooms. Babies are still having babies, and policymakers are trying to punish them unfairly for us to be peeking in bedrooms. People are still trying to live without the transformative power of God for us to be peeking in bedrooms. If you remember the story of Eutychus, in, I want to say it was the book of Acts, or later on down the line, where Paul was about to leave the church, and he decided to pour everything he had into the church, so they had a love feast that night, and they made it so, they made it late enough to where the slaves who had been working all day and all weekend might not have had a decent meal to eat, could come and eat and fellowship, because church ain't church if the whole family can't come. 
and it tells the story of Eutychus, who was one of those slave boys. He had, he had, he had toiled all week. The atmosphere was just right. His belly was full, and he, 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 he decided, I got to go hear Paul. He said he, he intended to hear every word that slipped from the mouth of Paul, but his belly was full, and the, 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 the atmosphere was warm, and those lights kept flickering with that hypnotic glow, and after a while, he started to try to fall asleep. And so he decides, I'm going to perch myself on a second-story window because he thought that the wind would blow through the window and keep him awake. Well, eventually he succumbed, succumbed to sleep. Text says he fell from the window. And there are those who suggest that People say, well, he shouldn't have been in that window in the first place. He had no business up there. It serves him right. But I want to, I want to give a, a, a theological clap back because if you, if, if you weren't never in that situation, the truth of the matter is you have no clue what window you would sit in. And so what the church needs to do and what we needs to do, need to do as a people is recognize that we have our own stuff too. We have our own skeletons in the closet. We have our own dirty laundry that we don't want anybody to find out about. And before you go to condemn someone else, put that down. Thank you. 